Father, we thank you so much for you. Lord, you're so good. Lord, we, we just want to praise you. Lord, we have spent some time praising you in song. Lord, we want to honor you now. We want to worship you by giving time for you to speak to us through your word. And Lord, once we see what your word says, help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives. Help us to be wise enough. Lord, help us to love you enough to do what your word says. Lord, we thank you for this time and pray that you would bless it by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's teaching is Loyalty to God First. Moving past all of the hebegots in 1 Chronicles, we get to something that was covered in 1 Samuel, you know, when David was on the run from Saul. Uh, but some of the facts uh, concerning David's men recorded here in 1 Chronicles weren't mentioned in 1 Samuel. Uh, like one of the things that we read when we were studying 1 Samuel was in chapter 22, verse 2. It says, And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. And there were about 400 men with him. Now, by the time you go a couple more chapters, you, or actually just the next chapter, chapter 23, we find out that, wow, that number had increased to 600 men. And the men who chose uh, to be on David's side, it says here in, in 1 Samuel 22 that they were in distress, which means in trouble or desperate. How? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know why. Why were they in trouble? Were they fugitives from justice or something? Were they outlaws? We're not told. And it says there were those that were in debt. It's literally they had creditors. The net Bible words it. They owed someone money. And so, okay, were they trying to escape paying their debt? You know, which wouldn't be too honorable, right? <laughs> He's like, oh man, you know, you owe somebody money, so you're gonna you're gonna run off and, and and join David and like, oh well, maybe you know, if I'm on David's side when he comes to be king, then he'll forgive my debt. He'll tell that guy that I owe, hey, leave him alone. You know, he, it's it's covered. Or who knows? You know, <laughs> not very honorable, but that's a possibility. And it also says, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's literally everyone who was bitter of soul. Uh, they were unhappy. It, it's translated some places or dissatisfied. And about what? We're not told. <laughs> Again, more stuff we really don't know. But reading this, you could get the idea that David's men might have been all a bunch of riffraff, you know, <laughs> a bunch of malcontents, scumbags, you know, they're trying to get out of doing what was right, get, you know, running from the law and all that kind of stuff. But we really don't know too much about what was going on. We're going to learn some more about him, though. But when we read that they were in distress, uh, it could be that they were... Uh, maybe in distress, in trouble because of injustice, uh, because of uh, corrupt local officials that the King Saul wasn't, you know, doing anything about kind of thing. That was a real possibility. Maybe they were discontented or dissatisfied because of how Saul uh, was running the country or how Saul was treating David, especially if they knew that God had rejected Saul and had chosen David instead. And at this time, folks, most people did know that. Uh, it, it's, it's very possible, especially since uh, there was that time when we were in 1 Samuel that we saw it, it was a very visible thing. It was, it was out in front of all of the soldiers that this happened, where, remember, uh, Saul had offered an illegal uh, sacrifice. He, he was not supposed to be the one to do that. That wasn't the king's job. That was the job of the priest. And they were supposed to wait until Samuel got there. Saul got impatient and said, look, we got to go fight a war. And, you know, we, somebody's got to offer this offering. So God's with us. So he went and did the offering himself. And just as soon as he finished, who shows up? Samuel, right? And Samuel asked him, what have you done? And because of that and a number of other things, Samuel said, you know, because you continuously 
disobey God, God has rejected you as king, and he has, has, has really taken the kingdom from you. He's, he's re rejecting you. And at that point, in 1 Samuel 15, 28, Saul had, had grabbed Samuel's robe to not let him go, and it actually tore the robe. And in 1 Samuel 15, 28, it says, So Samuel said to him, after he's torn his robe, he says, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Folks, that whole thing was very public. It was right out there in front of all the troops. And here in 1 Chronicles, it's been several years since that has happened. And this incident and the implications of that are now common knowledge in all of Israel. Everyone, everyone also knew that David was on the run. You know, he was on the run from Saul. I remember when, uh, when he goes to get help uh, from uh, Nabal, you know, Abigail's husband, right? You know, you, am I supposed to help every, everyone who, every, who runs away from their master, all, all the fugitives, you know? I'm supposed to help all those guys? Kind of, so everybody knew about it. And, and David now is there. He's, he's got these guys that are coming to him. Everybody knows what the scoop is, that God's rejected Saul because of his disobedience. And it seems that there's a certain type of, of man that comes to David. They're, they're gathering to him. They are defecting from King Saul, coming to help David uh, as David was on the run from Saul. But it's not, it's not the, the riffraff that you really think when we read in 1 Samuel. So in here in 1 Chronicles, look at verses 1 and 2. Now, these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers in the war, armed with bows, using both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. They were of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. So first thing we see is that they were mighty men. <laughs> the Hebrew word is gibor. It is translated in the Bible as mighty, valiant, Upright, champions, brave. So not the riffraff scumbags that <laughs> you kind of get the idea from, from 1 Samuel. And these guys were very helpful in the time of war. They were not only excellent archers, but they could sling stones with either hand. I, I've tried slinging a stone before. And it's not the, the kind of slingshots that we had as kids. This was the thing which you see, you know, in the Middle East, they still use them. And there's guys today that are really good at that. And they could hit, you know, a, a, a target 20 yards away, whatever. They're good at it. These guys could do it with either hand. And, and so these, these guys are, are valiant, upright men who are very skilled warriors. But something else we see here. That, that 1 Samuel doesn't tell us is that they were of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. Saul was a Benjamite, folks. The, these mighty men were Benjamites, and this is a huge fact. See, Israel was a very tribal nation at that time. That is that it was super important, which of the 12 tribes that you were from. And loyalty to your tribe was expected from, from every member of that tribe. And so for them to defect from Saul, one of their brethren, put the guys from their tribe, their own tribe, and align themselves with King David, who, who was from Judah, that was a big deal. There, there must have been something huge on that, huge, hugely motivating them to do that. Now, we're not going to read it, but in verses 3 through 7, we're given the names of some of these guys from Benjamin, and... and they weren't the only ones that defected to David, though. Look down at verse 8. Some Gadites joined David at the stronghold in the wilderness, mighty men of valor, men trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions as were, and were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. That's, that's quite a combination. <laughs> that this, this tribe of Gad... There's guys defecting to David now, and they were mighty men of valor, trained for battle. And 
the other group, there were archers and, and the guys that would sling rocks, but now David has men that are trained with sword and shield. Uh, these were mean-looking dudes, faces like lions. You know, you can imagine what that means, right? <laughs> I don't know, they have like really sharp, gnarly teeth. I, I don't know. But they're, they're mean-looking. And they were extremely fit. I mean, you think about it. <sighs> Strong upper body. They'd have to have that to be able to handle the sword and the spear or in, in the shields and all that. You know, to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat like that, that takes a lot of strength, you know, upper body. But it, they were also fast on their feet. <laughs> they, they could chase an enemy up into the mountains kind of thing, like, like a gazelle. That's pretty impressive. Now, verses 9 through 13 list some of their names. We're not going to read them. But we get some more info as to how tough these guys were in verse 14. It says, These were from the sons of Gad, captains of the army. The least was over a hundred, and the greatest was over a thousand. Now, reading the New King James like that, you get the idea that they were leaders over. In other words, they were captains over a hundred men, or the greatest over a thousand men. But it also can be translated differently, uh, like the NIV words it. It says, these Gadites were army commanders. The least was a match for a hundred and the greatest for a thousand. And I kind of lean to that translation because, see, that's in line with what God had promised Israel if they obeyed him. He blessed them like this. In Leviticus 26, 7 and 8, God tells Israel, you will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. So they're doing what God said would happen there. These guys are tough. Something else, look at verse 15. These are the ones who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it had overflowed all its banks, and they put to flight all those in the valleys to the east and to the west. The first month on the Jewish calendar would correspond to like mid-April to mid-May on our calendar. So it's in the spring. And they would be uh, experiencing the spring rains at that time along with the melting snow from Mount Hermon that would cause flooding down in the valley below. And the Jordan River would overflow its banks, making it impossible to cross, except for these tough guys. These, these are tough dudes. These Gadites were like the Navy SEALs of their day, right? They, they do this huge water crossing without boats, carrying their weapons and their gear, all their, their kit, all everything that was necessary, and they go right into combat, defeating the enemy, and then chasing the survivors wherever they were. These guys are tough. <laughs> now, warriors, valiant men, Coming to David was actually becoming a thing. <laughs> Look down at verse two or 22. For at that time, they came to David day by day to help him until it was a great army like the army of God. Now, so you, you look at that and think, wow, okay, we get some more information about these guys. We see that they're, they're tough guys. They're honorable guys. They're warriors. They're skilled. But why? Why would they come to David? Because they're doing so at great risk. See, if Saul had been able to find them, and if he came with all of his army, he would have killed them all if possible. He would have wiped them out. They, they were traitors in his eyes. Well, there are some reasons. I think one of them was that David had proven himself as a mighty warrior. He, he was a tough guy himself, right? You know? While he was with Saul, remember, he was Saul's right-hand man at one point. When he gets introduced to Saul, you know, that's when Goliath is out there. You know, yeah, I'll kill you all. Yeah, come on, send somebody. Come on. You know, and David is just incensed because this guy, this, you know, as he calls him a, a dog, a <laughs> heathen dog, you know, is putting down the God of the universe, the God who David loves. 
And, and David is like upset. He's out there with the troops and with his brothers who have already mocked him. Well, you come out here, you leave those few sheep that dad left you with, come out here to get entertained by the war, huh? You know, and he's hopping up and down mad. And, you know, aren't you guys going to do something? Come on, man, do something. And everybody's going, shut up, man, that guy's big, you know. And so he finally, he goes to the king. And the whole deal with the king tries, you know, Saul puts on his armor and David's like, I can't move. <laughs> He's just a teenager, and, and Saul's a big guy. Remember, he was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. And, and David goes out there in his, in his you know, shorts and, and uh, sandals and Goliath all you know, armored up and everything. He's got his big spear and sword and all that. David, boom, you know, one, one rock right between the headlights, man. He's down. They remembered that. And after that, David became kind of like uh, the, uh, the main general. He would be leading Israel's army uh, instead of Saul. Saul should have been the one, but David was out there leading the army. And the men there knew it should be Saul. Should, Saul should be the one here. But David, man, he was out there, you know, whooping up and taking names kind of thing and uh, they, they really respected David, and David's reputation grew. Remember the song that the women were singing? David and Saul are together, and they come into the city, and these gals are singing, hey, they're here. Saul has killed his thousands. Yeah, that's right, I have, you know. And David is ten thousands. <laughs> what? <laughs> they're giving more honor to David. But the thing was, it was true. David was the warrior. He was the one leading the troops. These guys knew that. These kind of guys, they would have recognized David as a real warrior, as, as a real leader. They would have respected him. Man, he's one of us. You know, this guy, he can get it done. This guy, man, yeah, I'll follow him. And so they were coming to him. But it was more than just being a warrior, among warriors, a man's man kind of thing that caused them to follow David. Look at verses 16 and 17. Then some of the sons of Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. And David went out to meet them and answered and said to them, If you have come peaceably to me to help me, my heart will be united with you. But if to betray me to my enemies, since there is no wrong in my hands... May the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. So we see more of Saul's tribe, Benjamin, and more of David's tribe, Judah. They come to him at the stronghold now. And so get that picture. David's there hiding out in the stronghold, you know, and this large group of guys, you know, they're coming down the road, man, they're coming towards where he's at. And that stronghold, uh, the Hebrew word is Masad or Masada, uh, it's an elevated position situated on top of a hill and David has a high ground which is a strategic advantage even today when when soldiers go to war but if this group was sent by Saul to capture or kill David you know they don't know or are they here to help David David doesn't know so David comes out himself and faces these guys, and no doubt there were a lot of his soldiers with him at each side and behind him. Hey, David, we got your back, man. Whatever these guys are up to, we're here. We're with you. <laughs> and don't miss, though, <laughs> this whole deal, and I think this is one of the keys to why they're following him. We see David's godly character here. See, if they're for him, his heart's with them. All right, man, I'm, I'm with you guys. But look what he says that if they're there to betray him. May the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. He didn't say, if you're here to betray me, man, you know, I'll kill you all. And if that was Saul, he probably would have said something like that. But see, David knew that God said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart. And I believe that's another quality that drew these men to David. His godliness, his love for God, his love for God that caused him to be loyal to God, to obey God. See, even when his men wanted to kill Saul on two different occasions because Saul was trying to kill their leader, David, David wouldn't let him. 
Remember the time when he goes into the cave where all his guys are hiding in the back of the cave? Saul's going in there to go to the bathroom. <laughs> David sneaks up and cuts off a chunk of his robe. Okay, and David felt bad for that because, ah, oh, man, you know, I disrespected the leader of our people. And God says not to do that, whatever. But God, David wouldn't let his men, his own men, do Saul in because it wasn't right. It wasn't right according to God. And, and folks, it's been my experience that when people that really love God, that trust in the word of God, even when they are behaving badly or when they want to behave badly, they'll appreciate someone who refuses to compromise with sin, especially when it would seem to benefit them. It would have been a great benefit to David, right? For them to do away with Saul, they wouldn't let him. They saw that. They recognized that. And even here, you know, God will get you. <laughs> God will take care of you. But here, again, here is is the real reason I believe they chose to follow David. Look at verse 18. Then the Spirit came upon a Maasai, chief of the captains, and he said, We are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the truth. See, they were godly men. They believed God's promises. They knew that God had promised that he was taking away the kingdom from Saul and giving it to David. They believed God. The, the chief of the captains, Amasai, he even, I mean, he's a godly guy. He even has the Holy Spirit come upon him to pronounce a blessing on David and David's helpers. <laughs> we want to be one of those helpers, <laughs> you know. God's going to bless you, David. God's going to bless the guys that are on your side. See, they, they had to trust God to come to that conclusion. And he tells David there that they're on his side because God was helping him. And that, they, that meant, they, they knew it in their hearts that, that David was on God's side. For God to be helping David, then David had to have been on God's side. So they went on David's side. They, uh, we're, we're with you. We're with you. We're with God. And that's why they followed David, I believe. They recognized God's hand was on David. There's no doubt there. That that's, that's what they're saying. They knew that God had taken Israel from Saul and given it to David. That was common knowledge. They wanted to be on God's side. Their loyalty to God first is displayed here by their loyalty to the one God chose the one that God had called to lead his people, the one that God had obviously been helping and blessing this whole time. Shortly after this, Saul and his son Jonathan were both killed. And look what happens then in verse 23. Now these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. And then it lists all the additional warriors that came to David from all the different tribes and as they installed him as king of Israel, according to the word of the Lord. God had declared that back in 1 Samuel. And as we've seen in our study of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, Israel has had its ups and downs, right? Right here. They're way up. Right here, they're loyal to the Lord. Not all of them. And you can later on today uh, read 2 Samuel chapter 2 uh, of a couple of guys that weren't loyal. A number of them weren't. A guy named Abner and Ishbosheth uh, were more loyal to Saul and their tribe than to the Lord. Didn't matter what God had said. They went against the Word of God and Abner took Ishbosheth, one of Saul's sons, uh, and made him king. And you know what? It didn't go so well. It only lasted for two years. And he caused a lot of harm among God's people during that time. And folks, that's always the case. When God's people 
don't put God first, the rest of God's people will suffer for it. I've seen it over and over again. God's people are always to put loyalty to God above all else, above everyone else, certainly more than the government. You think about New Testament, standing before the Sanhedrin, the Council of Elders, they're called sometimes, the 70 ruling leaders of Israel. When they were told by the rulers not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, Peter and the other apostles standing before them in Acts 5.29, we read this, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen, right? I hope it's a strong amen from everyone. <laughs> See, when obeying the government means disobeying God, we're to disobey the government. That's a no-brainer. We're to obey God instead, to be loyal to God over the government. But do you know that we're also to be more loyal to the Lord than even our own tribe, our family? Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, especially those of you who come from very tight families. I've talked to people through the years, shared the gospel with them, and they knew, okay, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. I need to put my trust in Him. But you know what? If I became a Christian, my family would disown me. I, I couldn't live with that. On the other hand, I have known people, uh, friends, good friends, that came to the Lord knowing that their family would disown them. And this one gal, Shoshana, uh, Jewish, came to the Lord, and her family had a funeral service for her. She was as good as dead from that moment on because she received Jesus as her Messiah. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, folks, all we are, all we have, everything that is in us, we're to love God first. We're to love Him supremely. Our loyalty to the Lord should be out of love. That should be our motivation, out of love for Him. Love for Him because He loved us first, right? <laughs> love for Him because He died on the cross for us. Love for Him because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and drew us to Himself. The Bible tells us if, if the Lord didn't draw us, that no one would come to Christ. you know that? If you're a born-again Christian... Understand, that didn't happen by accident. You didn't stumble into a church someday or, or just so happened to turn on the TV when Billy Graham was on preaching a salvation message or whatever. It wasn't by an accident. God loved you so much. He orchestrated things in your life to draw you to himself so that you would find out how much he loved you. And, and, and that's, that's where our loyalty to God should come from because of who he is what he has done for us, his great love for us. That's why we should be loyal to him. Now, if, it, if that love for him isn't enough to be loyal to him, it should be, but if it's not, don't forget what 2 Corinthians 5.10 says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And Romans 14.12 says, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And those are written to Christians, those verses. He's speaking to believers in Christ. It won't be friends and family. It won't be the government officials that we'll be standing before giving an account of ourselves, of what we've done with our lives. It'll be the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine whether we're saved or not. The, the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers, and that's what he's speaking of here. It's to give us rewards or lack of rewards with what we've done. But folks, we saw a couple weeks ago that the time is short. We've seen how, how we should be living in this time. Loyalty to the Lord our God 
should be above everyone and everything else. Everything, no matter what. We can read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs or DC Talks, uh, Jesus Freaks, I mentioned that a couple weeks ago, and see what it costs many of our brothers and sisters over the years to be loyal to God. But folks, I believe in my heart that we need to set this matter straight in our hearts and minds now because we may have to make some of these choices sooner, <laughs> sooner than we think. It seems that things are heading that way. So I, I want to encourage you. Settle this in your mind. Settle this in your heart today that you will put God above everything else, above everyone else, that he will be number one. He will be the one that you love most and the one that you are loyal to the most, no matter what. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all of the things that we'd mentioned just a few minutes ago, all those things that you've done for us. We thank you for your character, for your unwavering love and mercy and grace that, that is you and that you have poured out to us. Father, help us to respond rightly to your love. Lord, help, help us to love you more. Lord, help us to trust you more. As that one father in the Gospels that, uh, that your followers couldn't help his son, how he told you, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help us, Lord. Help our unbelief. Help us to set that aside and, and totally trust you that we, Lord, would be loyal to you above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise him with one last song before we go.